Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler Unscripted, the podcast available for SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and of course as a full video on YouTube. In today's episode, I'd like to speak about the new Omega Seamaster 300. Now the Seamaster 300 has always been a bit of an unusual product in the Omega collection. In fact, it was one of my favourites when released in 2014, and has remained one of those watches which you really appreciate and respect, but never really ever considered buying, which is perhaps an obvious demonstration of why Omega felt they needed to update it this year in 2021. On a personal note, I actually feel quite pleased that this watch is being updated this year, simply because I predicted it earlier in the year when I was considering what might be released this year, so I'm actually rather thrilled that I was right. But Omega have really gone a long way with this watch, and in a more subtle way than you might first expect. The watch has new dimensions, although whilst it remains the same diameter, the case is entirely new. It also has a new dial construction, new hands, a new crown, a somewhat new movement, and unifies design features with other watches in the Omega collection, like the Aquaterra and its new crown design. Perhaps most surprisingly, Omega has actually chosen to release an entirely new material for this watch for the 10,000 or so pound higher level model, which sits below gold offerings and above steel ones. And this version is produced from an alloy of gold and copper to produce sort of a golden and bronze mix. And I'll explain this later on in the podcast because I think it's very much worth noting, not only because it represents the beginning of a new material and indeed collection of watches potentially in the future from Omega, but also because that watch has unique features and unique design elements. But the result is a brand new collection of watches which represent a very, very different face to this inherently vintage offering from the Seamaster collection. In a strange way, it even seems like Omega has made the Seamaster 300 an anachronism if compared to the original 1957 version upon which this watch and indeed this collection is based, because this watch is more of a Seamaster 300 if it were made in the 1940s, which is a bizarre consideration, but also one which is very interesting. In essence, therefore, it seems that Omega has taken a leaf out of Tudor's book with the creation of the Black Bay. So look forward to all of that in today's podcast. Before I begin, remember that you can catch all of these podcasts as well as full reviews, articles, and much, much more on watchchronicler.com, the real centre of the Watch Chronicler experience of the watches we all love. Also, follow us on Instagram to always know about the latest videos, podcasts, and other content which may be of real interest. Now, to understand what this new 2021 Seamaster 300 really is, I could simply rattle off the specifications and be done with it, but I think that's too simplistic an approach. You see, since 2014, the Seamaster 300 has evolved enormously. It's evolved into a more vintage offering, a more modern offering, and an assortment of pieces and nuances which have to be compared against each other to really understand where they are today. So I think it's worth starting in 2014 when the first Seamaster 300 of this vintage style was reissued. Now 2014 was actually quite an important year for Omega, because it was two years after the release of the Tudor Black Bay, and therefore the craze for vintage-inspired watches, particularly from larger brands, was becoming serious. This was also a year after Omega launched their first anti-magnetic coaxial calibre in the form of the 15,000 Gauss Aquaterra in 2013, and so it made sense to combine these two influences to create a vintage-inspired dive watch. One also has to remember that in 2012, the Seamaster 300M, that's to say the Pierce Brosnan era James Bond watch, had been updated, but it still used an older movement, and so, aside from the Planet Ocean, no other dive watch from Omega had their new in-house or fully in-house movement, you could say. And the format chosen was that of the 1957 Seamaster 300, that's to say the first of Omega's dive watches, and a very elegant piece too, with an unprotected crown, straight lugs, very fine bezel and broad arrow hands. As a side note, the format of the later Seamaster 300 from the 1960s with its lyre, twisted lugs, and bolder dial is echoed in the Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean, which of course we're all familiar with. And sizing-wise, this piece was rather modest at 41mm wide, but with 21mm lugs and a 15mm thickness, it was always a bit of an awkward piece for a lot of people to wear. Ironically, of course, that's actually the sizing which the new Rolex Submariner has chosen to take, so clearly they did have some good ideas, apart from that thickness, which was a problem. The watch also had a very lustrous approach, with polished centre links on the bracelet, polished tops to the lugs, brushed sides and a polished bezel. Speaking of the bezel, the insert chosen was quite a modern choice. It was a thin, liquid metal ceramic bezel insert, which is to say a ceramic bezel insert with metal forced under pressure into gaps in it, to form essentially indestructible numerals. The luminous pip was also placed at 12 o'clock, 
and it was a generally very understated, very delicate style in terms of design. This watch also had a subtly domed sapphire crystal, which really was a very fine dome, nothing like you see on a Tudor Black Bay, for instance. Beneath this, you had a dial which was a near facsimile of the one seen in 1957, with triangular tooth-shaped markers around the dial, and very clear, crisp, white Arabic numerals around the dial. Now, these originally did have serifs, and they chose to do away with these for a more modern look on this watch, but the format in terms of font and placement on the dial was spot on. This also wasn't a ceramic dial as seen on later Omega dive watches, but rather a matte black or matte grey form. The surface of the dial was also laser cut, so that the indices would be sunken into the dial. That's to say, they weren't a sandwich dial, so you didn't have a separate plate underneath the dial. But these laser cut recesses allowed for Superluminova to fill the dial. Text had been altered somewhat, it has to be said, when compared to the original, given that Omega and Seamaster were both seen at the top of the dial, with Seamaster in beige, and movement details placed below on the bottom half of the dial. Speaking of movement details, there was something worth noting about the movement in this watch. This watch used the Omega Calibre 8400, which was based on the 8500, the movement seen in the first of Omega's watches to have their own entirely in-house designed movement. What was different about the 8400 in this watch was that it offered anti-magnetism on a serious level through a lot of silicon components in the escapement, the springs, the balance wheel. This watch was able to resist 15,000 gauss or one and a half Tesla way beyond anything else on the market. And whilst some things had surpassed that, such as some IWC pieces in the 80s, those weren't very well constructed and simply weren't conceived for daily wear. Importantly, this was also a movement from Omega's higher level of coaxial movements. That's to say that in years after this, the 8800 series movement was released as a smaller alternative with a shorter power reserve and a lesser feature set, because this watch had a 60 hour power reserve and an independent hour hand so you could jump between time zones without actually stopping the watch. And the final detail to note, and the reason why I was fairly convinced this watch was going to be replaced this year, was the fact that the dial read Master Coaxial Chronometer. Now in real terms that meant absolutely nothing. It meant the watch was tested as per COSC certification criteria in terms of timekeeping, but these criteria simply weren't up to the level of accuracy seen from, for instance, Rolex, and also not any sort of representation of just how good these movements were. Subsequent Seamasters have had the designation of coaxial master chronometer. I know it's a very minor wording change, which means that these watches are tested by Metas, which is a much more rigorous testing setup and also a much more accurate one. But the watch released was an interesting hodgepodge of new and old. The bracelet, for instance, was comprehensively new, all solid, beautifully articulated, and also introduced Omega to the uh, micro-adjustment clasp in a modern sense, in that you would press a button and be able to retract or extend the bracelet by a few millimetres. I don't know if this was the first watch to feature it, but certainly it was one of those which introduced this to the Seamaster collector at large. But the problem with this watch was that it combined a lot of new and old in a potentially difficult way to sell. You see, the dial had a lot of false patina on it, where the colour of the Superluminova was concerned, which was a very deep sand colour, but the rest of the watch actually felt comparably modern. So I suspect that might have hindered this watch's sales, particularly in its later years of production after the update of the Seamaster 300M, where the price difference was considerable, and I can see why someone might be reluctant to spend more on a watch which, on paper, is more simple. This semi-modern influence was reinforced, you could say, by the 2015 Seamaster 300 Spectre edition. Released in a very large, it has to be said, limited run of 7,007 pieces, this watch was essentially identical. Functionally, this watch was the same. It had the same movement, the same construction, all of the same mechanical elements. The real change here was seen to the dial and the bezel. The dial had the same black-grained effect, but added somewhat different hands. The hours and the minutes remained the same, but the white lance hand of the standard watch was replaced by a white lollipop hand, which was similar to those used by Omega in the late 1950s, and a thoroughly appealing design, one which has reappeared on this latest watch, and I think with very good reason, because it's a beautiful design, and one which Omega deserves to be able to present. The 12 on the dial was also replaced with an enormous and very modern Omega logo, and the associated text grew as well to fill out the top of the dial much more considerably than on the standard watch. Additionally, this watch offered a NATO strap as the Bond option, to coincide, you could say, with Omega's offering of such straps for their other models too. Now, the biggest change on this watch, however, was the change to the bezel. You see, to fit with the international traveller style of that Bond film, 
the bezel was replaced with a 12-hour bezel, so essentially a semi-GMT bezel to be able to track other time zones. And this was a very successful watch and remains a very desirable one. And the funny thing is, this is a more modern interpretation of the Seamaster 300, and I think the success and popularity of this design says quite a lot about what didn't quite go right with the 2014 edition. In 2017 came the final, you could say, pre-2021 Seamaster 300, and in many ways this was a completely different watch to the two which has preceded it. Certainly it had an entirely new case. The case was 39mm now, with 19mm lugs, and how we love Omega with their unconventional lug widths. The watch had a more vintage style crown with a much more simple, much more traditional form, and a solid case back which was nicely decorated with the hippocampus, which obviously wasn't seen on the open case back version from 2014 and 2015. What you have to understand about this watch though was that it was designed to look exactly like the model from 1957, and as a result it had a bezel which was aluminium and also which was an entirely different design with a much more old school format and indeed an unsuccessful format because it was dropped after just a few years in the late 1950s and very early 60s. For quite a lot of people I know this was seen as rather an unappealing design element, personally I didn't like it at all, but I respected Omega for bringing back something which wasn't necessarily the most refined design in the world. A similar attitude of similar design but comprehensive change was seen on the dial. The design was much flatter, there was a matte dark grey colour to the dial rather than a black colour, and the indices seemed much flatter too. The white Arabic numerals remained, but now with serifs as per the original, and these were closed in format, so the, the 6 and the 9 were closed as per the original, and not, as you will see, as seen on the 2021 version. The original text and logo was also retained, a very simple design with Omega and Seamaster 300, and the hands were finished differently. The hands now had curved polish over the top of them rather than a clear bevel, as seen on the previous version, and smaller loom plots were used. The second hand too was unluminous and polished. Where the movement was concerned, Omega had to choose a smaller movement, and so chose the somewhat less technically advanced but more compact 8806 for this watch. Still in-house and comparable to the movement you see in a modern Seamaster 300M, this movement didn't have the independent hour hand and also had a shorter 55 hour power reserve, but retained the same beat rate and also the same fantastic innovation as seen on the Big Brother movements. All in all, this watch was released in 3,557 pieces, in addition to 557 in a trilogy format with a number on the dial bought in addition to the associated Railmaster and Speedmaster that year. So having discussed the previous iterations of the Seamaster 300 and models which weren't desperately popular, certainly they weren't popular in relation to the massive growth of interest seen for other Omega models, what is new on this 2021 version? Well the diameter has remained the same at 41mm, which is a very reasonable size and one which fits most wrists, but the thickness has been decreased enormously from 15mm to 13.85mm, and this is important because the crystal is brand new. The crystal is no longer slightly domed, it's heavily double bubble domed over the surface of the watch, like a Tudor Black Bay or such a watch of that type, to give a much more vintage, much more characterful feel, something which is less of a somewhat austere balance of new and old, but much more of a spirited return to uh, lost time, let's say. The bezel grip is also new and finer, despite looking similar to the previous version, and the crown is now cupcake shaped, you could say, in relation to other models in the Omega line, like those seen on the Seamaster Aquaterra collection, which has seen a new crown with this particular shape. And the case back is new as well, because since the release of the 2017 model, NAAD case backs have become very popular in the Omega line with water resistant models. And essentially, this is a case back which doesn't screw on in the conventional sense, but which acts as a sort of bayonet setup. So you push the, uh, the case back in and then twist it so that it always lines up correctly with the rest of the watch. The bezel on this watch is also very new, or rather very old you could say, because Omega have thrown away the ceramic insert of the previous version entirely, and they've given up its enormous scratch resistance, the high-tech element of a liquid metal bezel, and instead have produced an anodized aluminium bezel. Now aluminium is arguably the most practical solution for a bezel insert, because if it dents you can replace it very easily, or if you damage it during use it won't shatter but it'll remain in place until you have the opportunity to fix it. But it isn't scratch resistant in the same way which ceramic is, and isn't seen as a high-tech material, and I would agree with that analysis. 
However, a vintage watch does need a certain characterful element, and since we've seen the success of this on the No Time to Die Seamaster 300M released last year, perhaps the year before actually, it's difficult to tell now that the movie has been so heavily delayed, we have an anodized aluminium bezel insert. And Omega have also taken the opportunity to fill it with superluminova, where previously they would have had liquid metal numerals. So now the whole thing is luminous, in addition to having an oxalic coating, which, so they tell us, is a highly scratch-resistant coating to make it tougher than a traditional aluminium bezel insert. Of course, only time will tell once these pieces have been worn very heavily, but it's certainly interesting to see Omega going back in the previous direction for the sake of giving the watch a warmer, more vintage-style appearance. This also presents the argument that Omega has decided that, in reality, technical advances are not necessarily necessary. They may bring greater resistance to a watch, may make a watch seem more cutting edge, but actually what sells watches for Omega on the whole is whimsy, it's nostalgia for a past time, in a way which I don't think is true for modern Rolexes. So it's very interesting to see them play to this even more with the aluminium bezel insert. Personally, I'd still rather have the ceramic one, but that's just me. There is a lot of change here, but arguably the biggest change is the dial. You see, the dial opening is now larger at 30.4mm rather than 295 and this may seem like a negligible change, but the reality is that the proportions change the appearance of a watch profoundly. Firstly, the hands are now narrower, and they have a circular central section with a more quaint, narrow metal shaft instead of the much cleaner lines of the previous version, which personally I also prefer. There's also new branding on the doll, which I think is fantastic. This watch now simply reads Omega Seamaster 300, admittedly with a modern font, and leaves no further information under the eye. All the rest is on the case back, which I think is much better, because fundamentally this is designed to be a vintage-inspired watch, and not a modern, technological one. Maybe the most obvious change is the new second hand, which takes the popular lollipop hand of the Spectre Seamaster 300, and replicates it, but without offending the owners of that limited edition watch by producing it in polished metal rather than in white, which I think is a very well-judged move. Finally, we have the dial itself, which is a 1940s-style sandwich dial, where you have an upper section and a lower section in two separate pieces. The front piece is also new in the sense that, aside from having those cutouts to show Luminova from the back plate of the dial, this watch has cut-out Arabic numerals, at each quadrant of the dial. And this is something which simply wasn't the case on the original. There's no argument it wasn't the case on the original, and also the choice of font is entirely new. It has open 6 and 9 numerals, and these are not historically accurate, but still have an element of historical whimsy which shows that Omega wants to produce less of a vintage remake and more of a heritage face for the whole Seamaster collection, which I think is a successful move, but certainly not something for someone who wants something historically accurate. Furthermore, the bracelet is new, with polished outer links instead of polished centre links, although I must say these are going to collect scratches just as much as the previous versions, and the bracelet now tapers to 16mm at the deployment, which creates a more delicate feel. Where materials are concerned, there's a lot to think about here, because Omega have entirely removed the titanium option from this watch, and pricing is fairly reasonable. You see, with the previous generation of Seamaster, you would pay between £5,000 and £5,280 for the steel version, and £6,950 for the titanium model. For the new model, this is somewhat different, because prices have risen slightly to £5,280 on the strap, and £5,560 on a steel bracelet, but fundamentally the arrangement is different, because the titanium option has been removed entirely, and now you simply get options for a blue or a black version in steel, and then of course the unique new material, for just under £10,000. And the new material is an individual and unique one. It's called bronze gold, and that really is essentially what it is, because it's 50% copper, which in, in essence is what you need to produce bronze, which you would alloy with another metal, usually tin or aluminium, for example. And this watch is also 37.5% gold, i.e. 9 carat. So this watch is, on paper, a 9 carat gold watch, or a bronze one, depending on how you want to look at it. Because in addition to copper, you have palladium and gallium added, which change the colour, and a bit of silver for patination of the case over time. So you have an odd material, because it can't quite decide if it wants to develop a beautiful patina, like bronze, or if it wants to remain precious and beautiful forever, like gold. Now, in a lot of countries, 9 karat gold isn't classed as gold, and this is an interesting quirk to this watch, 
So I'm not sure how you should address it, whether you should look at this watch as something of a meeting ground between these two interesting materials, or whether you should see it as a more subtle way to wear a gold watch, or perhaps long-lived way of wearing a bronze one. I don't know. The bronze gold version is functionally the same, except that it has some elements retained from the previous generation. Notably, it has a ceramic bezel insert instead of aluminium. It also has a bronze dial, which is oxidised to the brown colour it is, with a German silver base onto which the superluminova, which shines through, is painted. The final touch differentiating this is a lance second hand, which is paired with a much more extensively brushed case to give a very different aesthetic and a very different look. And oddly, I'm not sure if I like it or not, but certainly it's very, very different. Inside this watch is a very similar movement to the 8400 in the last generation. Notably, it's a revision of the 8900 series movement, which has the same architecture as an 85 and 8400, except which is now METAS certified. So this is a no-date version of that watch. And there is then the 8913, which is the gold version with some gold elements within the movement. And what's really interesting here is that that movement is now seen in the previous generation precious metal Seamaster 300, which remains in the Omega collection, which strikes me as a very interesting comparison that you do still have access to that older watch if you're prepared to spend £24,000 or above on any of the versions of that with a gold or platinum case, in addition to a dial which is produced from various semi-precious stones. So what does all of this mean for Omega? What have they understood about their heritage, about their way of designing watches, which presents the future for their vintage-inspired Seamaster 300? Well, I think that Omega has realised that in order to create a good heritage watch which conjures up all the romanticism of a past, and perhaps even a semi-fictional one, it has to overplay pastiche without simply recreating what was around previously. So the 2014 version was a mix of faithful replica and modern watch, thus reducing the audience it was realistically going to appeal to by splitting it. And that's a role for the inherently old-fashioned but still current Speedmaster Professional, not the deliberately vintage Seamaster 300. If you wanted something modern with vintage touches, ultimately you could just buy a Planet Ocean. The 2021 version, however, understands that it's the feel of a vintage watch which matters above all else, and so ultimately the exact details don't really matter so much. Of course, there are plenty of watches for which a faithful replica is perhaps the best way to experience the watch, like, for example, a Doxa Sub, where straying from the original actually tends to reduce the appeal of the timepiece because the original was so well designed. By contrast, the Seamaster 300 is more of an iconic ancestor to a watch than a watch praised for its exact design. So I think what Omega have done with this new collection is very clever. They've created a whimsical fiction for people to enjoy on the wrist, with the same sort of charm as you get from a Tudor Black Bay, which isn't in any way a vintage remake, but has the spirit of its ancestor within its design. Let me know in the comment section below on YouTube what you think of my understanding of this watch, and how you see this watch in relation to what we've seen before from Omega. Also, remember to follow us on whichever podcast player you enjoy using to always catch the latest episode of Watch Chronicler Unscripted. Thank you very much for listening and watching. This is Armon from watchchronicler.com. Out.